Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 12, verses 22 to 31, and then through J.C. Rowell's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 12, verses 22 to 31. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. This is the word of the Lord. We have in these verses a collection of striking arguments against over-anxiety about the things of this world. At first sight, they may seem to some minds simple and commonplace, but the more they are pondered, the more weighty they appear. An abiding recollection of them would save many Christians an immense amount of trouble. Christ bids us consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, but God feeds them. Now, if the Maker of all things provides for the needs of birds and orders things so that they have daily supply of food, we ought surely not to fear that he will let his spiritual children starve. Christ bids us look at the lilies. They toil not, they spin not, yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God every year provides these flowers with a fresh supply of living leaves and blossoms, we surely ought not to doubt his power and willingness to furnish his believing servants with all needful clothing. Christ bids us remember that a Christian man should be ashamed of being as anxious as a heathen. The pagan world may well be anxious about food and clothing and the like. They are sunk in deep ignorance and know nothing of the real nature of God. But the man who can say of God, He is my Father, and of Christ, He is my Savior, ought surely to be above such anxieties and cares. A clear faith should produce a light heart. Finally, Christ bids us think of the perfect knowledge of God. Our Father knows that we have need of food and clothing. That thought alone ought to make us content. All our needs are perfectly known to the Lord of heaven and earth. He can relieve those needs whenever he sees fit. He will relieve them whenever it is good for our souls. Let the four arguments now adduced sink deep into our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. Nothing is more common than an anxious and troubled spirit, and nothing so mars a believer's usefulness and diminishes his inward peace. Nothing, on the contrary, glorifies God so much as a cheerful spirit in the midst of temporal problems. It carries a reality with it that even the worldly can understand. It commends our Christianity and makes it beautiful in the eyes of men. Faith and faith only will produce this cheerful spirit. The man who can say boldly, the Lord is my shepherd, is the man who will be able to add, I shall not lack. Proverbs 23, 1. We have, secondly, in these verses, a high standard of living commended to all Christians. It is contained in a short and simple injunction, seek the kingdom of God. We are not to give our principal thoughts to the things of this world, We are not so to live as if we had nothing but a body. We are to live like beings who have immortal souls to be lost or saved, a death to die, a God to meet, a judgment to expect, 
and an eternity in heaven or in hell awaiting us? When can we be said to seek the kingdom of God? We do so when we make it the chief business of our lives to secure a place in the number of saved people, to have our sins pardoned and our hearts renewed, and ourselves made fit for the inheritance of the saints in light. We do so when we give a primary place in our minds to the interests of God's kingdom, when we labor to increase the number of God's subjects, when we strive to maintain God's cause and advance God's glory in the world. The kingdom of God is the only kingdom worth laboring for. All other kingdoms shall sooner or later decay and pass away. The statesmen who raise them are like men who build houses of cards, or children who make palaces of sand on the seashore. The wealth which constitutes their greatness is as liable to melt away as the snow in spring. The kingdom of God is the only kingdom that shall endure forever. Happy are they who belong to it, love it, live for it, pray for it, and labor for its increase and prosperity. Their labor shall not be in vain. May we give all diligence to make our calling into this kingdom sure. May it be our constant advice to children, relatives, friends, servants, neighbors, seek the kingdom. Whatever else you seek, seek first the kingdom of God. We have, lastly, in these verses, a marvelous promise held out to those who seek the kingdom of God. Our Lord Jesus declares, All these things shall be added unto you. We must take heed that we do not misunderstand the meaning of this passage. We have no right to expect that a Christian tradesman who neglects his business under pretense of zeal for God's kingdom will find his trade prosper and his affairs do well. To place such a sense upon the promise would be nothing less than fanaticism and enthusiasm. It would encourage slothfulness in business and give occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. The man to whom the promise before us belongs is the Christian who gives to the things of God their right order and their right place. He does not neglect the worldly duties of his station, but he regards them as of infinitely less importance than the requirements of God. He does not omit due attention to his temporal affairs, but he looks on them as of far less moment than the affairs of his soul. In short, he aims in all his daily life to put God first and the world second, to give the second place of the things of his body and the first place to the things of his soul. This is the man to whom Jesus says, All these things shall be added unto you. But how is the promise fulfilled? The answer is short and simple. The man who seeks first God's kingdom shall never lack anything that is for his good. He may not have so much health as some. He may not have so much wealth as others. He may not have a richly spread table or royal delicacies, but he shall always have enough. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Isaiah thirty-three sixteen. All things shall work together for good for those who love God. Romans 8.28 No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. Psalm 84 verse 11 I have been young, says David, and now am old. Yet never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Psalm 37 verse 25 That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we have just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, in our thoughts about God, do we really believe He knows and cares about our needs? What does that realization do to our hearts? Second, do we belong to, love, live, pray, and labor for the kingdom of God? And lastly, God has promised that we will never lack what is good for us when we seek first his kingdom and righteousness. Can we say that this is our top priority? <music>